Well, welcome, uh, fellow Linton travelers. It's our, our uh, fourth Sunday, I think, in Lent. And uh, we are roughly halfway through, I think. We have three weeks uh, until Easter. Uh, so plenty of time still to slip into Lenten practices if you haven't had a chance to. Plenty of time to still pick up our uh, Lenten devotional, um, which many of us have been uh, reading and meditating our, our way through uh, on a daily basis to real, real enrichment. Uh, we might start, as I like to start, just quieting our uh, hearts and minds from whatever's racing through them. And if you're like me, there's sometimes a lot racing through uh, my heart and mind, even when I come to church this morning. But I might have a short meditation here, music and heart. from the uh, contemporary American painter named Brian Kershiznik and a piece of music is from the great uh, Estonian Christian composer named Arvo Pert, um, which some people might know. <clears throat> I'd like to start us by just reading a few excerpts from devotionals this week and ask you to pay attention to kind of common thread that at least I saw through most of the days this week, which will lead into our conversation uh, with our, our three uh, pilgrims up here, Chris Hall, Heather Dill, and Carol Cunion, um, members of, of uh, Good Sam's community that I'm sure you, you know. Bonnie O'Neill uh, started us off on Monday with, with this. We find ourselves today entering the third week of Lent not yet halfway through our journey to the cross, how are you holding up? Are you seeing and sensing the love of your Savior, Savior more clearly? Or are you hoping for a more dramatic transformation into his image by this point? If we learn one thing from the psalmist in today's reading of Psalm 80, it's that only God <clears throat> can save us from the enemy and from ourselves. Let the thrice repeated refrain of Psalm 80 buoy you as you continue your Lenten journey. O God of hosts, restore us and cause thy face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. Where do you need restoration in this season? What change do you most seek from Jesus? 
Are you willing to earnestly entreat him to come prostrate before him to the point of becoming undignified? Amber Skinner wrote this on, on Tuesday. Lent is a time to remind myself that I am no better than any stubborn and rebellious generation from Israel's history. Do I not witness time and again God's miraculous works in his creation, in his sacraments, in his word? Does he not provide my daily bread every time I ask? And yet, how often I still flatter him with my mouth, lie to him with my tongue, find my heart disloyal to him and unfaithful to him. I attribute all my blessings to my own work, but I deserve God's anger just as much as the ancient Israelites did. And Chris's reflection from Thursday. Human beings demonstrate a relentless attitude and behavior. We willfully sin and imagine that we can get away with it. Yet the bills always come in. And then taking, he takes us to the Godfather and the Mafia. Uh, <clears throat> and near the end, he says, we all have our mafioso moments. We are wise to consider them during Lent. Pride always deceives. We say, I can get away with this, and then whack the bills for our thoughts or behaviors smack us in the face. We end up bruised, but hopefully wiser. The next day, Stephanie Roussel. Awareness of our sin is lavish grace from heaven because it leads to awareness of our Savior too, which is a greater blessing. Minimizing our wickedness is basic human instinct, but we are called to set our minds on things above. So, I learn to be grateful when the Holy Spirit makes me keenly aware of the ugliness of my sin. This undeserved gift is an invitation into deeper grace. <clears throat> and then this morning, Carol's reflection. In this age of anxiety, it's not hard to see dangers and disasters all around us. Some are caused by our own past or present folly and rebellion. Others are the accumulated outcome of policies and choices made far from our own realm of influence. The season of Lent is a time for review. How have we contributed to the difficulties we encounter? How have we rebelled against God's good ways? When have we chosen folly or resentment? Where have we embraced darkness rather than light? What thread do you see? What, what did you hear through all those reflections? They were all sinners. Sin. Yeah. I mean, frankly, sin. Um, and our own brokenness. And so when we started this journey in Lent, we reflected on Lent as a practice of 40 days. We reflected upon our own uh, experiences of Lent. Two weeks ago, we reflected more on Christ and his right-side-up kingdom and the upside-down way we live. But we thought this morning it be appropriate to just spend some time reflecting on sin. So all of our devotional reflections led us there. Let me take us there and lead into our conversation <clears throat> with a, a poem that's very been, been very instructive for me over the years. Um, it's called Adventures in New Testament Greek Metanoia. Metanoia is the Greek word to meaning to change our minds or hearts, which we translate repentance. But this contemporary poet, Scott Cairns, <clears throat> ha has this reflection comparing the kind of easy English word repentance with real metanoia. But let me read this, and then we'll have a conversation. It's reflecting on metanoia. Repentance, to be sure, but of a species far less likely to oblige sheepish repetition. Repentance, you'll observe, glibly bears the bent of thought revisited and mind's familiar stamp, a quaint half-hearted doubleness that couples all compunction with a pledge of recurrent screw-up. The heart's metanoia, on the other hand, turns without regret, turns not so much away as toward, as if the slow pilgrim has been surprised to find that sin is not so bad as it is a waste of time. <clears throat> and friends, I might start with a couple questions coming from that last couple lines. Uh, the slow pilgrim has been surprised to find that sin is not so bad as it is a waste of time. Can we reflect together first maybe on 
why is sin bad? Let's start there. I'll start. Um, Psalm 107 gives a number of categories of people who have fallen into hard times. And one of those categories of people are people who have rebelled against God. And they are trapped, they are caught, they are imprisoned, they are enchained, they are in darkness. And that's what sin does. It traps us, it enchains us, it puts us into darkness. And then there's another category of people whose rebellion has carried them further into blindness and folly. And sin does that too, it makes us blind. It makes us blind to God's goodness, it makes us blind to each other, it makes us blind to, to grace. Um, it, 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 it separates us, um, it does terrible things to us, and those blind people in that second category end up not even able to eat <coughs> healthy food. They end up on the verge of death because they can't even see what's good for their own sustaining. Um, and, and that's what sin does. It, 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 it totally warps our perspectives, it totally mm. separates us from anything that's good and healthy, and it traps us in a way that we can't escape. Well, there's two other categories. Oh, okay, are. I'll tell you the two other categories. <laughs> the first category is people who are um, in, in, de in, in desert wastelands, and it's not clear whose fault it is. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they there because of, of drought and famine? Are they there because of geopolitical malfeasance that they had nothing to do with? They are victims of something going on, but it's not their fault. It doesn't appear to be their fault. And the fourth group is people who are, who are doing productive work. Um, they are m merchants out on the seas, who are caught in a storm, and it's, there's no hint of it that being their fault. And what's, what I love about that psalm is, we get into dark places, sometimes for our own mess up, sometimes because we're victims of a, of a, of a challenging world, and, and the solution to all of them, I'll give you the one little hint, is to cry out to God for his grace. Um, and, and I think the people who are wandering in the desert and the people who are you know, on the ship have an easier time crying out for grace. The others have gotten themselves so trapped and so turned around that they don't even know that they need to cry out for grace. But there are way, many ways to get into trouble. It's not always our fault that we're in trouble, but the solution is always the same, to cry out to God for grace. I might add just one thought to the um, four descriptions from the Psalms. Um, I think sin is so bad because an aspect of it is that we're fundamentally focused on ourselves and our own well-being versus the well-being of those around us. So that is one point I'd add. Why is sin so bad? Wow. I think sin, it really it relates to what you're both saying. Um, sin is so bad because every time we sin, we violate the two greatest commandments love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So every characteristic uh, you mentioned is striking to me is an evidence of a precious image bearer who's violating the commandments and particularly in those stances, it's very hard to see beyond yourself. Uh, the commandment to, to love uh, draws me out of myself because my natural default position is to place the, my ego at the center of my existence, and that's mm. deeply problematic. Mm. Is that what you're getting at in your reflection when you say pr what pride always deceives? I mean, you, you take us to pride in your, your reflection. Chris. Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, a, a fundamental movement toward love is to move um, from self-deception to self-awareness. And uh, there's an inherent I'm smiling because this is so true in my own life. There's an inherent falseness to sin. Now just think about the, uh, we can interact with the group, I guess. Just think about the last time you sinned. What was the dynamic? Well. It was about 15 minutes ago, so it's not hard to call <laughs> yeah, that yeah. line. <laughs> yeah. it, it's the dynamic of thinking, I'm gonna get something. I desire something so deeply. This is going to meet my needs. Mm -hmm. My needs. And it's never true. It's never true. And we end up with a taste of uh, dust in our mouths and thinking, it's like, it's like, I've often thought, it's like I lost my mind. 
I lost my mind for the past five minutes or the past 10 minutes or hour or whatever it might be. But it really, I really thought it would really be good to lose my temper. <laughs> or I thought it'd be really good uh, uh, to have three donuts rather than one. <laughs> uh, that inherent falseness um, to sin. But the incredible thing is, you know, that proverb, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool to his folly. Right? If you ever lived with dogs, you know that's true, and it's disgusting. <laughs> and it's, it's quite a metaphor, actually. Because, yeah, we taste the dustiness. We, we, we know it's unsatisfying. But, but yet, we go back to it. But each sin leads us to the next one because something I do I do something that I shouldn't and something stops me and then I have to push out against that thing and it's that thing's fault or it's that person's fault or it's that system's fault or God is not kind because he told me not to do this or each sin leads to another sin and we spiral further and further into sin and further and further into separation and further and further into blindness. It's just the way it's the way sin works. Say more about, like, what do you mean each sin leads to another sin? Well, because you have to then justify, or you have to then excuse, or, or, or you've broken a relationship, and the only way out is to lean towards the person in love and grace, but sin has already put that barrier there, and so it's like, well, I can't do that, so then I'm going to do this other thing, um, and it just goes on. I mean, that's in Psalm 107. If you read it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an escalation of, we, we turned our back on God, so then we did this thing, but then we did this thing, and then we ended up way over here. Um, it's each step. It's, it's, not, it's not like, it, you know, it's not sin. It's just like I take a step here, and then I step back. I take <coughs> a step here, and then I step back. No, the way sin works is I take a step here, and pretty soon I'm being propelled by my own folly, my own blindness, and, and, the, and the reactions that I've caused around me. I'm just being propelled in that other direction. And I love that, that, that poem those last lines of it's not so much a turning as a leaning towards. Yeah, it's not it's, turning away, it's, it's turning towards. It's, and, and I've been kind of doing a, um, a little Lenten study on, on grace and God's kindness. Hmm. And there's a way that that's translated as leaning toward. And the idea that God is leaning toward us <laughs> and the way that we escape our sin is to lean toward his grace. We lean back. And I'm sure I've got the the language studies all messed up, but, but I've had that image in my mind of God's grace leaning toward us, and when we lean back, you know, it's like a kid who's, I was a youth pastor for a while, and I'm a parent and a grandparent, you know, there's a kid, you know, the kid does something wrong. I can remember one of our kids who had left the house when she had been told not to, and when I came out, then of course she had to run, and once she ran, then of course she had to cross the street, which she was definitely not allowed to. And pretty soon we're like this dashing through the neighborhood. And, and it just escalates like that. And yeah. I'm still huh. leaning toward her. Huh. But the only solution is for her to stop and lean back towards me, which eventually happened. But it's a, it's a long journey there sometimes. And we don't escape our folly until we do turn and lean back towards our Father's embrace. Yeah, and I would add to that. I think um, for certain sins, there's something appealing about the sin. There is, if you think of a situation where someone has irritated you and you're angry about it, there's there's something, uh, your, your emotions get stirred up, your heart uh, races, and there's something like satisfying about just laying out a litany of complaints, <laughs> which is not a good thing, but then, then that can build upon itself. And I would argue that doesn't actually make things better, but in the moment, you can be tempted into seeing, well, now I feel better and I feel more justified. And so mm -hmm. that might lead to another litany of complaints or certainly it will lead one away from any attempt to reconcile or overcome mm -hmm. those feelings. Doesn't that take us back to what Chris said, though, that we're, sin, is us, it, sin is us putting ourselves at the center. And so as soon as we start this dialogue of I, you have offended me, you know, then it, then it just, just goes on and on and on because I become more and more the center and you have offended me more and more and it's not how did I offend you or how did I offend God or or <laughs> you know a pause to reflect that maybe you have a story that I haven't heard it's all about me and that's mm. and that's the danger in sin too is it just gets more and more I get more and more wrapped up in my own little cocoon which is really in, in, enslaving me to myself mm. and in, and in kind of Enchaining me in this in this little little um, cell of my own creation. So it's Martin Luther's one of his great 
uh, descriptions of sin in the Latin is in curvatus in se, mm -hmm. which is in turned in upon oneself. Uh, and that's... Home run. Yeah, I mean, right? That's exactly it. In turned in upon oneself. And I always picture this like snarl of barbed wire kind of wound up in and of it, you know, in, on top of itself. And that's what I think it does. So somehow we have to uh, recenter ourselves. Yeah. Recenter ourselves. If I place myself at the center, guaranteed, I am going to wreak havoc. I'm going to wreak havoc on myself, uh, members of my family, broader community, uh, wreak havoc. And I, I, I love that phrase of Luther. I, I think Augustine used it too. That probably, yeah. That, probably, that we're that's right. curved in on ourselves. And that's a stance that's guaranteed to result in disaster, plain and simple. The, the difficult thing is it seems so plausible to be safer if I'm in control of my life, even though I'd like to tell other people, uh, God's in control. <laughs> if I'm in control, we feel safer, plus, uh, plus, I'll get what I want. Is that what you mean by in control? Yeah, yeah. In control. It's, yeah. I mean, are we in control when we're in sin? What's that? What's that connection? No, we're, we we're think. We're, see, sin isn't. It, it's it's inherently. Just think about the last time you sinned. I thought I was going to get something. I was self-deceived. Yeah. But I believed the lie. Um, it, it shouldn't surprise us that that this is dy the dynamic of sin. Because, uh, you know, sin goes beyond ourselves. You know, there's, there's other realities and beings involved in our sin. We have to accept pers personal responsibility for our sin. But at the same time, there's a whole realm of what I would uh, call supernatural evil that delights in feeding off of our mm -hmm. own, <clears throat> our own uh, propensity to continually place ourselves at the center. Oh yes, you're safer there. Believe me, trust me. And we end up trusting, trusting this uh, the evil one and the demonic, which uh, delight in feeding off the. Here's a Brian mm -hmm. feeding off the cracks in our own personality. That's what I I, I, I was re thinking about earlier. Self-deception to self-awareness. And the self-aware person would recognize the cracks in their own personality. Know where the, the curving in manifests itself. So if I, uh, and apart from that knowledge, uh, we'll just be like a, a bowling ball rolling around and uh, r running into other people, and if I can stretch the murder for it's gonna break, running into ourself all the time. And then we end up realizing it wasn't true. Don't you, just for a moment, think back to the last time you sinned. I said that earlier. What was the dynamic involved? And what did you think you were gonna get out of it, and what did you get out of it? Yeah, that's right. right. I mean, because there's self-deception and there's self-awareness. Sometimes there's also just a being swept along. Uh, I mean, I, I teach Dante's comedy a lot, and one of the great images in the, the Circle of the Lustful, they're caught in this dark storm, and it's just blowing them around, and they have no control, and they're just letting themselves be carried. And it's a beautiful image of the, the lustful person. So any little gust of wind or any little you know vision of flesh sends them off into to lust, and that's what's the lustful are caught up in. And that's what sometimes temptation is like that. And you, it's not until sometimes after you sin, you realize I've, I've been being driven along in a kind of passive way and I've just let myself be, be carried along. I mean, is that part of self-awareness? I guess recognizing that when I'm being driven along? It just, it's just sometimes sin is passive. In, in that sense, yeah. I feel like. Like, I'm not, like, looking to commit sin, but I just let myself get caught up and swept along and pushed along through, you know, 
dark forces that are driving me or my own? Well, I would say about self-awareness. You know, so self-awareness is an interesting thing. How do we get there? How do we, if we are blind, if we're caught, if we're being swept away, how do we get to self-awareness? And that, to me, is where we, we, we cry out and we say, I'm, I am, I am yeah. out of control here. I am caught. I am trapped. I am stuck. And I need, I need grace. You know, that's really, I need God's grace. I need God's kindness. And then, and then for me, at least, it's, and God, you need to show me what's real here because I have no clue. Um, so so self-awareness, mm -hmm. to me, I feel like, I, how, how would I know that? I mean, I grew up in a kind of very dysfunctional family setting. Um, I grew up in a, in a church setting that had a lot of weird stuff going on. Um, it's really easy for me <laughs> to get swept into all kinds of weird currents and not really know what's true and right. Mm. And what I've learned over decades of crying out and saying, I have no clue. You know, how would you have a good relationship when every marriage in my family, going back mm. how many generations, detonated very yeah. early? Um, how would I have a good sibling relationship when my my, the generation above me was threatening to kill each other, and mm. I watched that mm. happen. You know, how do you do that mm -hmm. um, without crying out and saying, God, show me what's real here. Show me what's true here. Show me That's an right. avenue out. Show me what it would look like to be a person who pleases you mm -hmm. instead of a person who is caught mm -hmm. up in generations of sin. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not only, not my own sin, sin of other people's that's come trickling down into every yeah. fiber of myself. It's God's grace that invades us and shows us what it would look like to be different. Uh, Heather, hearing Carol, I ask you to come, ask your, your reflections, response to this one line, it's turning not so much away as toward. I mean, this isn't a piece of scripture up here, but I, I, it's, 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 it's useful. Because there's a way in which turning away from, I can become, I mean, there's a way in which I, I, I could become obsessed with my own sin. And I, that could be caught up in my, I'm just always meditating on my own sin. But that, that line, not so much turning away as turning toward, how do you hear that line? In light of what Carol. In light of what Carol was just saying. Yeah, well, my reflection on Carol's comments is that, is the relational dimension of sin. So sin breaks relationships, it breaks our relationship with God, it breaks our relationship with each other. And then the self-awareness piece, maybe the turning toward is the willingness to be in relationship, to re-engage with relationships. So you commented on re-engaging or calling upon one's relationship with God. There's also the practice of building that relationship with others. So when I think about how does one become self-aware, my greatest opportunities of self-awareness have come from other people telling me. Um, Here's a big mirror. Yeah. Heather, take a look. <laughs> and when you're a parent, you have lots of people telling you that, so that's, that's one right. element. But I have very precious memories throughout my life of friends, say, mm. pointing out one failing or another mm. in love, of course, and that's why it sticks out to me. I also have a very strong memory of my mother pointing out one particular sin, and I've just always remembered it because mm. it was... I think she hit the nail on the head for the first time in a way that I understood, but mm. it, that relationship piece of it, and um, and then the willingness to, the, I think the turning toward is the willingness to engage and be open to it's what. It's a relationship. Yeah. I, I still want to get to how it's a waste of time, but let, let me ask you a question. When we think about turning to relationship and being in a relationship with people who can speak into our lives, it makes me start thinking about what are the practices that we have that keep us aware, that keep our, keep our brokenness before us in an appropriate way. One of the things that the reformers actually were regretted giving up in the Reformation was the practice of individual confession, which is still practiced, obviously, in Roman Catholic churches and Eastern Orthodox churches, but not in the Protestant tradition. We confess our sins corporately, but we don't have this individual confession, this kind of almost weekly death to self of bringing myself before another person and can, confessing. I Chris, am, have I thoughts? Am, I, am, <laughs> I am smiling uh, because I went to confession yesterday. Yeah, yeah. What's, uh, that, ex I mean, it, 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 what's that experience like for, it for has, us who it haven't practiced that? It has dramatically changed uh, and brought healing into hmm. my life. Uh, how so? Knowing that I'm going to actually have to look somebody in the face and tell them what I've been up to 
is a, not, not necessarily for every, everybody uh, really takes a wise uh, priest that you're talking to. And thankfully, uh, those are the folks who've been helping me. So um, the opportunity to come in to a certain context and have to tell the truth. <coughs> and ha not euphemize. <laughs> not euphemize, but tell the truth. Uh, name something yeah. for what it is in the presence of another person has been really helpful Because one thing that sin does, it wants to keep us in darkness and keep our sin secret. And as long as nobody knows, I might feel bad, but then I'll forget about it or I'd practice forgetting, you know, and pushing it away. God's not there confronting me. I don't hear him. So we keep ourselves by ourselves. And I think that's one thing that sin does, but confession just shatters that yeah, to some degree. Yeah, well, it does. It, for me, say I've done something, something uh, wrong, something sinful, something <clears throat> I knew I shouldn't do, and yet I wanted to do it. And then I realized, oh, man. Now I gotta tell. <laughs> now I gotta tell him. And um, in my experience, in that context, looking yeah. a priest in the face uh, has been helpful to me to put a break on my natural tendency to do it again. Yeah. Because I know now that's not a good it. idea. And so what's happening? Uh, this is how uh, I think confession can work in a positive, a real positive way. Is slowly, slowly slowly straightening me out. And always within that context, what I've heard in response is the first words out of a priest's mouth have been to me, God loves you. God loves you. And then to hear with my ears, you're fully absolved of all your sins. Mm. Forever and ever. Mm. Mm. That's been, that's been helpful to me. Now, I know that perhaps other people have had unfortunate experiences in confession. You get a, a knucklehead for a priest. I'm sure that can happen. But I've been graced uh, to have folks hmm. who, are, who are wise uh, counselors. And I've, I've also had uh, to move beyond uh, just the, the context of a, a confession uh, to a, a priest. Uh, I've had mentors, like you were mentioning, mentors uh, in my life who uh, have been more than willing, relationships, more than willing to say to me, you're being a knucklehead, here's how. And that, that's been really helpful yeah. too. Because there are strains within the Anglican tradition that do practice confession. Yeah, in, right in our prayer book. Yep. Yeah, well, I just want to... Re individual I just it's not something we generally practice. And so, I mean, one, one follow-up question is, is there, a, is there a way to bring this into our, you know, well, he, he's devotion. sitting right there for crying out loud. <laughs> he's sitting but right there. But one of the there. nice things about in the Orthodox and, and Catholic tradition, it's built into our yeah. regular practice in a way it's not. So I still, if I'm going to go to, you know, Father Philip and confess, it still takes a kind of like titanic movement of my own will to like make that happen. It's, it's not built into our regular practices. Yeah, I think it was, a, I think it, like you said, I think it was a mistake the reformers made. We and have... It's there. Family, it's something called the Anglo Catholic tradition. That's my churchmanship. That's actually <laughs> Brian's churchmanship, too. Where that's more of a commonplace yeah. private confession. Yeah. We have had in um, Good Sam's tradition, um, Lenten confession, that you just make an appointment, a kind of mm. the, the encouragement to do yeah. that, to make yeah. an appointment to go and, and, and do confession before you get to Easter. That's yeah. been a tradition. I would say, too. We do have weekly confession in our liturgy, which many other church don't. traditions that's, don't. That's right. And I really value that. The, the, and I, I sometimes wish we would pause just a little bit longer when we get to our, our, um, our confession. Um, 
just to pause enough time to say, yeah, I have not loved my neighbor as myself, but I take that seriously every week. When I get to there, mm -hmm. I do think, I have not loved my neighbor mm -hmm. as myself. Um, I have not put my neighbor's priorities high enough in my priorities. I have hurried to get in the front of the line yeah. when I have you know, stepped past other people in you know, that's true. It is built into our weekly practice. At reminder, least we have a moment. A, a it, reminder that's every right. week. Yeah, that's we right. fall short. We do fall yeah, short. And, that's right. And I think that's an important thing. I was going to say a practice I have is is daily journaling as a as a form of examine, yeah. as a form of yeah. you know kind of looking at <laughs> okay where did I mess up yesterday? Where did I step on people's toes? Where you know and 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 to and to reflect in prayer and do I need to go back and do I need to go and say hey I handled that badly or you know to to, to daily, and I have a kind of a deal with God in my in my prayer journal, which is I don't write stuff that I know is not true. You know, and there'll be times <laughs> when I'm about to write my self my self justification, and yeah. I just feel like, Carol, no, no, yeah. no I can, actually, actually, I was wrong. Huh. You because know, you know, because Carol, I know that's not true. You know that's not true. Yeah. So who are you so, kidding? So there are you, you moments know, yeah, I'm about right. to write some very, you know, you know, this person needs to do. God, I need to have this person change in this way yeah. and it's like no actually yeah. <laughs> hey before i in, invite uh, just you know in what time we have left a uh, kind of larger conversation here i'd love to get your reflections on that that last line about sin being a waste of time mm. um, how does that strike you sin being not so much bad in the poet's mind here but as a waste of time well i'll say when people talk about you know if salvation is only so that we go to heaven so we should just do what we want now and then just before. And we'll, I think you've missed the point completely. <laughs> I mean, the, the point is God's grace in our lives every day, all day, living in relationship with God, living in relationship with other. That's the point. And what a joyful thing that can be. Um, and, to, and to think that you know, doing my own thing is going to lead to any kind of happy. I mean, I said, I grew up in a very dysfunctional household. I saw all kinds of sin up close and personal every day for a very long time. And it is absolute misery for the people involved and for everybody who comes anywhere in their, in their orbit. Sin is miserable stay away from it, run from it, mm. and, and confess it as quickly as you can because it just destroys everything it touches. Mm. Mm. That line, uh, last line made me, th I mean, of course, there's many ways in which sin is a waste of time. If you're involved in activities that one shouldn't be doing, that's mm. one example. But when I saw that line, it made me think of sort of the internal sin, if you will, the thoughts one has, the frustrations. Um, and how much time and, and emotional time and energy mm, it can mm, take mm. to just stew on something yeah. when a more pr productive or constructive perspective or just a decision to say, I'm going to put that out of my mind and I'm going to focus on something else. It, you can spend a lot of time stewing and that's where I think one way in which sin can be a waste, a waste of time. Of time. Yeah, Chris, how does that line strike you? Um, we've been given a gift of, a gift of years. Yeah a gift of years, <coughs> and we're pilgrims, yeah. uh, heading towards home. We're not there yet. It's a gift of years that we're moving towards home. Um, Which is where I want to be. Yeah, That's where I was made that, to be. That's where I want to be. That's what, where, that's where my true flourishing and real life happens. So every time that we uh, sin, we're being diverted from the pathway. Yeah. We're slowing down or we're being distracted from the heart of the matter, and it just slows us down. Uh, Again, from getting, what I really yeah. from getting what I really want, which is to be home, which is to be like Christ, which yeah. is to be in relationship That's with right. other people, which yeah. is to be in relationship with God, which is what I was made for, and it just slows down my progress yeah. to, to, to ever getting there. There's also the, 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 the vision of the kingdom of God, you know, that your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And, and that's what we're really called to be agents of that kingdom. I mean, we are invited to be agents of that kingdom here on yeah. earth, to be people who show God's grace, show God's kindness, um, set things right, um, nourish the people around us, help the community wow. we're part of to thrive. That's what we're invited to do. Mm -hmm. And that's a really joyful thing, but it goes, it ripples. That's the, re I mean, so sin ripples, and, and you talked a little bit about that, that sin ripples. You do something and it just kind of 
threads and affects mm -hmm. everything. But being agents of God's kingdom also ripples. And you see it ripple. You see people that you've lived into living into other people and living into other people. You see the joy of good fellowship and, and good community kind of <coughs> expand beyond beyond your, your reach. And, will be, and to me, that's, that's the incredible joy of, of stepping back from sin, leaning into God's grace, leaning into other people's lives, to see that grace just mm. spread mm. and expand mm -hmm. and to see little uh, glimpses, hints, joyful, joyful visions of the future kingdom that we're called to be part of then, but also called to be agents of now. Mm -hmm. And sin gets in the way. Sin blocks that, messes it up, slows that down. And, and if, if we <laughs> lean away from sin and lean into God's grace, we get the great joy mm. of seeing that grace expand. And being part of it and, and being, being a part of participate it's in a it. It's a great yeah. It's like building a beautiful, a beautiful, you know, there are people who, who, you know, you're building a beautiful structure, whatever that might be, and there are people who are joyfully being part of that but encouraging other people to be yeah. part of that, and then there are people who are coming and just chipping away, and that's what sin is. Sin is chipping away, and it's like, don't do that. Please yeah. don't do that. Um, that. That, to me, is what sin is doing. Well, what time we have left, and we're, we'll close with a, a lovely prayer of confession from the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, but I mean, just in open the conversation up to questions, responses that people have. Oh, there's lots. We should have given more more time. Let me just start here just because I happen to see this hand. All right, sure. Um, you know, I have a problem with some of the things that all of you have said. Uh, it seems like sometimes the evangelical church, I guess I, I guess I can use this. Is our mission sin management? Are we always to feel crappy about ourselves, yeah. perpetually ashamed? Every time I've heard the word sin mentioned in any church I've been in, it's always because you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Um, knowing that I'm a sinner and feeling crappy about myself doesn't stop me from sinning. Abstinence alone will not work, I'll bet, for anybody in this room to stop sinning. I can't put a rubber band around my yeah. wrist and snap it <coughs> and say, oh, I'm not going to sin anymore. I have to have, sometimes I have to look at the source of my sin. Like, why am I doing this? Okay, don't tell me that Adam and Eve screwed up and that's why I'm a mess. That doesn't work for me. Yeah. I have to look at the source of why I'm sinning and go back in time maybe. I'm not talking about looking at your navel and all that stuff, but sometimes we have to do that and look at that, right. and we have to move beyond just thinking. Sometimes I think the church just teaches food poisoning and doesn't teach us how to cook. That's not my quote. That's somebody else's. But there has to be a positive way out of yeah. sin, number one. And sin can be a good thing in that eventually, if it happens long enough to you and you're so sick of it but you still do it, you need to look for something good. You can't replace sin by doing nothing. By just That's right. You have to replace sin by looking for something good in God, the love of God, the acceptance of God, the beauty. You've got to do that. I have to do that. And I, don't, and I think some of you have alluded to that. Yeah, but and I, think but that's I get what tired I, of the message over right. and over again that we're sinners and, and we're lower than whale manure. And that's not <laughs> Yeah, and I hope you didn't hear that sin. up here because I think there is a way of yeah. fetishizing sin in a, in a really oh, yeah. unhelpful way. And sometimes there are traditions that, that will do that and will spend, yeah, it's, it's this constant message that I'm a sinner, I'm lower than dung, this kind of, this kind of stuff. And I don't think, I, I was hoping, I hope you didn't hear us say that. I think this was an opportunity for us to say in this season of Lent, th this is an appropriate moment. To, to stop and reflect and say, where do I, where am I broken? And I think Carol was trying to, uh, was mentioning this. Where does that brokenness come from? And, what, or, you know, Chris, what am I trying to fulfill in myself through this sin? And I, and I take that line not so much away as toward, as really getting at what, what you're saying. What am I turning towards? And some of that is, it's why two weeks ago I, I was hoping we'd spend time reflecting on Christ and think, this is what I'm turning towards. And the new life we were just mentioning, that's what I'm turning towards. So I, I think, yeah, there's, you're, there's right, certainly certain uh, what, you, what you're saying right there. Heather, do you want to, do you have thoughts on this? Uh, that too. One is uh, it's been helpful to me to just always think about what does it mean to live a life full of love? Yeah. And in those moments when I'm tempted or frustrated, just how do I respond in a loving way? And then service opportunities, it sounds so mundane, I guess, at some level, but I think of the moments of greatest joy in my life have been when I've been out able to come alongside someone in whatever capacity. Yeah. And I've been trying to cultivate that in my children as a way to focus on others, but as just that sense of joy, the kingdom of God here on earth. So those are two ways. Yeah. That's, a, that's the sort of aspirational component that we should not lose sight of. I heard Absolutely. Dallas Willard what you were saying. 
the gospel of sin management. That's yeah, problematic. That's, that's problematic. Um, Bishop uh, Barron, a Catholic bishop, has helped me. And I, th I think this is, in some ways this is what you're saying. Uh, <coughs> moving, what's repentance? It's moving beyond the mind that we presently have. Moving beyond the mind that we presently have. And during Lent and, uh, is the time where we slow down and actually ponder, ponder the, what, what's going on in our lives. It's, it's an astringent time is what I would call it. Mm -hmm. An astringent time, a, a cleansing time as we're mo learning to move beyond the mind that we've had uh, to a new place with love always the result. Yeah. I think one of the easiest sins that people have, that I have observed, is lying. And Carol, as you said, one lie leads to another, to another, to another, and spins this big web. And finally, that person doesn't know what the truth is anymore. Mm. Okay? Mm. And it's unfortunate because the only way out of that is don't lie. <laughs> Tell the truth and allow the love of Christ to infuse into your life and keep you in, headed towards the right direction. So that's, that's all I needed mm -hmm. to say. Augustine reflects on lying, and he, he comes back where, you know, Augustine starts by saying, let's reflect on who God is. God is God of truth. I was made to use speech truthfully. So, so he says moving away is moving towards that idea of meditating on what I was, what I was made four, and that's how we make that transition. Yeah. So I heard all three of you talking today about, all four of you actually, <clears throat> how sin, in cravatu sin se, we look in upon ourselves, and how that separates us from God. And the gentleman over there mentioned um, that um, you know, this sort of a barren wasteland, I guess, to paraphrase what you're talking about, and how do we move beyond that? And the point I want to make is, while sin separates us from God, bluntly, sin also hurts those around us. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a huge takeaway in terms of trying to moderate and change behavior when you think how your actions not only separate you and your relationship with God, but how your actions and mannerisms hurt those people that you love mostly, and even those you just come in contact with. So to your point, sir, if, you, if you're looking for something to um, uh, modify behavior, recognize that you have the capacity to really hurt people when you, when you sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I looked at the last line, and for me, uh, the last line is very simple. Um, Father Phil ends each service, we only have a certain amount of time. None of us knows when yeah. God is going to call us. Um, and so what I hear right. in a very That's simple great. way is, if I am doing something against God, what else could I be doing yeah. at that very moment? You know, I've moved into a different part of my life. I see all kinds of people that I could speak to, encourage, help. But if I'm busy eating something I shouldn't eat, um, like ice cream, uh, <laughs> maybe I should be walking down the hall and talking to somebody that I know mm. could use a friend. Mm. It makes me, you know, what, what relationships am I hurting that I could be helping? What relationships am I damaging that I could be building? It's the same kind of idea. Yeah, it's a gentleman right over here. Maybe have time for one. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of, of Whitney's sermon this morning. I haven't heard it yet, where, so where do tell. He, well, <laughs> you, you've got to listen to it. I will. It's worth will. the time. He starts out by <laughs> talking about sin, but he moves quickly to John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It's about love. Yeah. And so the challenge, I suppose, is that we as Christians should saturate ourselves in God's love. 
-hmm. that, that it should sat, saturate our mind and body and behavior. And so how do I do that? How do I saturate myself in love of God? And the way to do that is go to God in prayer, but more importantly, to listen to God speaking to us through scripture. Yeah. There are infinite stories about God's love and how he manifested it to the world, to each one of us. And so as burdensome as sin is, love prevails. And I'll say love, each of this love, right. is, love is God is what God is all about. And I'll say each one of those devotions that I read from, they ended with a turn to God's love and ended with a turn to God's grace. Um, and so th this morning I wanted to just kind of push a pause and just give us a moment to reflect on sin, which, which our tradition, Christian tradition tells us, it is, is an appropriate moment, but it's not where we stop. It's an appropriate moment during Lent, but then we turn from that towards, and I think in the poem's point, in order to understand sin, we have to turn towards that love and grace of God first. I'm just going to close us just for the sake of time, those of us who have to, to, to go on. But I wonder if we can finish with this prayer of confession, which has some of these lines in it that, you know, strike us as sometimes harsh, but you'll notice at the end it does turn us to God's, God's grace and love. And um, this is from the... <coughs> Uh, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, the, the Canadian version, but it might be in our, in our version as well. I just know the Canadian version better. So we pray this together just to close. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But Thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare Thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore Thou them that are penitent, according to Thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Please join me in thanking our guests up here this morning, and Carol, wherever she went. Thank you, Carol. And with that, you're dismissed, and we'll see you next week.